Greetings, greetings, and thank you for joining us here at R. Kelly Appeal TV for podcast number eight. This is Solar Coaster Reading, the memoirs of R. Kelly, the diary of me. So for those who do not know what this uh, segment is about, please go to the channel and look at the playlist on Solar Coaster and you'll see podcast one and you can read the book in all chapters. So let's get started. We're going to be reading act two today. And the first, the first session is easy, easy. I think he needs something easy because his life has been rough and tough from this point. All right, here we go. One Saturday afternoon when I was in my late teens, I'm hanging out with my boys and we're bored. We decide to go downtown. How about Rush Street, Rob? Rush Street is cool. Let's see what's happening on Rush Street. He's very, very easy to get along with. Rush Street on the north side of Chicago Avenue had expensive restaurants, cool night spots, and lots of rich folk and tourists walking around, people with money and style. Rush Street was beautiful. We got some bus transfers, rolled downtown, jumped off, and there we were in the middle of the mix. Kids from the hood hanging with the rich people, checking out the scene. Rush Street was crowded with tourists, businessmen, and fine ladies. Compared to where I live, downtown was like a whole new world. And every time I went there, I always wanted to be part of that world. Me and my boys were sitting on the ledge near a fancy apartment building where we had a front row seat. To what was going on. I noticed a guy playing guitar had attracted a little crowd. His playing wasn't great and his voice was even worse, but people were busy throwing money into an open gu guitar case. That's when I got an idea. Hey man, watch this. I told my homies. I put on my shades, took the Chicago Bulls baseball cap off my head, put it on the ground and started singing Easy Like Sunday Morning by the Commodores a song I knew everyone loved. But with the cars and trucks going by, it was hard to be heard. So I sang really loud. I gave my solo everything that I had. Four or five people passing by stopped smiling, nodding in my direction. One guy gave me a thumbs up and dropped some change in my cap. Another guy stopped and listened to me for a minute or two. Then he dropped in a buck. A woman did the same, then another, then another. Before long, my cap was overflowing. I kept singing and folks kept dropping bills. Before I knew it, I had made close to $75. I'd never seen that much money at once in my whole life. I took me and my boys to a famous pizza place right in the middle of downtown called Giordano's. And though it didn't look like we belonged there, four or five raggedy Young boys from the projects, I have more than enough money to feed us all. And that's just what I did. We ate good that day. I even carved my name in the wall, a Giordano's tradition. Great day, Rob. Easy day. Easy like Sunday morning, I crooned. I think I might come back here tomorrow. No one said a word. My friend's silence gave me the idea that even though I was treating them to pizza, they looked down on what I'd done. To them, street performing was like begging, like being a bum but I don't care. Street performing that day helped me discover something new and exciting. I had talent and people were willing to pay for it. Next day, I went back to Rush Street by myself and made $90. It was there uh, for a lot longer. I was there for a lot longer and my throat got hoarse, but I hung in. I loved it. And so did the passing crowd. It felt really good to sing for people and make them smile. It felt even better taking money home to mom to help out with the rent. You got all this money by singing, she asked. People like the way I sing, mom, I said. I knew it, she said. I always knew that your singing was good enough for you to get paid. Are you proud of me, I asked. Son, she said, I couldn't be prouder. Moving on, niece. All through my school life, kids made fun of me once they found out I couldn't read. At home, even my brothers and sisters did the same. They called me all kind of nasty names. I would always try to avoid getting into it with my brothers and sister. Because every time we would get into it, the first thing that would 
bring, they would bring up, no matter who was around, was the fact that I couldn't read or write or spell. I remember that feeling this day. Lenice was a classmate who used to sit at a desk directly across from me in sixth or seventh grade. One day I noticed her watching me fumble around with my pencil while we were taking a test. She asked me if I was okay. I said right away, yeah, I'm good, and started staring intently at my test like I knew what I was doing. But her vibe let me know that she didn't believe me. I started filling in the circles fast so that from that perspective, it would look like I was act, act, acing this test. But sadly, I was failing it in every way possible. I couldn't wait for the bell to ring because I was so embarrassed. Recess was my only escape at the time. I would sit outside on the school steps and just watch all the other kids, some playing around, some talking and laughing, some playing sports. I would ask myself, why me? Why can't I read and write like everyone else? Why do I start to yawn every time I get ready to read something? Why is it that every time I open a book, confusing music notes start to ring in my head really loud as I look at the letters? My mother has sat down with me many, many nights trying to help me learn to read and write. She would even give me spelling bees. She would sit me down and spell out a word. Then she would make me sing the word while spelling it out after nothing else would work. Not knowing what I was doing at the time, I would always make a sentence out of that word and sing it back to her as if she it was a song. She would say, that sounds great, baby, but spell the word. And that's when everything would go blank, 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 blank. That's when I discovered that darkness did not just come from the flicking of a light switch, but it was also within me. Failing at reading hurt me a lot more than I ever let on. So when I met Lenise, I really appreciated her because she was the only one in school who didn't look down on me. After that first day in class, I started walking to her to her next class. Then was then we started hanging out during recess. She would also talk about dancing and I would talk about being successful. Lenise never cared about the fact that I couldn't read. She just loved to hear me talk about how I was going to take my mom out the hood and move her to some big old house up in the hills and how the driveway would be filled with all kind of cars and my mom would never have to worry or, or care in the world when it came to having the things she wanted. Lenise loved the fact that my dreams of success were built around my mother's happiness. Lenise was beautiful inside and out. She had light brown eyes, long sandy brown hair, and a dancer's body. She was a ballerina and a singer who understood my music and my talent just like I understood hers. She could dance in any style from classic ballet to hip hop. She had an old school soul and was wise and loyal. Lenise always believed in me. And all of that became the ingredients in the recipe and the big pot of love that I fell in. Nice had a grandmother named Grandma Cheryl who called everyone darling. When I met her, it was like meeting my own grandmother because she made me feel right at home. Grandma Cheryl loved me just like my mother loved Nice. Everyone got along like old friends. It all felt like family. I remember the first time Lenise took me home to meet her family. Her mom, Marcella, had some questions for me. Questions like, where did you meet my daughter and why do you choose her? We're in the same class and no disrespect, ma'am, but she kind of chose me. She also looked, asked me if I had a job. Was I going to college and what was I going to be in life? I told her that the time that at the time I didn't have a job and I doubted very seriously that I was going to college, but that I was going to be a very successful singer. And Lenise's mom laughed out loud and asked, how the hell are you going to, to be a successful singer or anything else if you don't go to college. I'm working on that, I told her. Marcella just continued to size me up as she asked me, working on that how. And even though I heard her, I said, huh? How are you working on that? That's when Grandma Cheryl interrupted. Darling, he's not under investigation, so quit asking him all these questions. If Lenise likes him, let then I like him too. So you just might as well get used to it. And that's when I fell in love with Grandma Cheryl. He has good manners. Thank you, ma'am, I said. I try. We better go or we're going to be late for the movie, said Niece. What are you seeing? asked Grandma Cheryl. I said, Beverly Hills Cop. Then Eddie Murphy is a good, that Eddie Murphy is a good looking man, said Grandma. He sure is, Lenise agreed. If y'all excuse me just for a moment, I said, I need to use your bathroom. I had to go real bad, but didn't want. Nisa's mama and grandmother to know I really had to go. 
In order to make them think I was only peeing, I had to get in and out in a hurry. When I got out the bathroom, Nisa's grandmother said in her voice that couldn't have been any nicer, darling, you better get back in there and fix yourself. What's wrong, I asked. Niece pointed to the back of my pants. I was in such a hurry that I hadn't torn off the toilet paper that was sticking out the back of my jeans. I ran back to the bathroom and first thing, opened the medicine cabinet to see if there was poison. It, I was really ready to kill myself, but there was no poison, just aspirin and bandages. I straightened myself out and got ready to face Niece's folks again. This time, I made sure there was no toilet paper um, out my backside. I guess I'm just a little nervous, I said to Nisa's grandmother. We noticed, said Nisa's mom. <laughs> location, location, location. The Chitlin Bucket. Street performing is as old as America itself. History tells that founding father Ben Franklin performed his poetry on public streets. A lot has changed since then. When I came of age in Chicago, if you wanted to street perform, you had to pay for a license. When I saw the number of people that I could draw by singing, I got serious about my street act. I took it so serious that I even got a license from the city so that I could per perform legally. I knew I could draw even more folks if I used my old broken down keyboard, the old Casio that Willie Pearl had given me. Thanks to Miss McClin, hardcore and disciplined training, I could sing a, a acapella or sing while playing the keyboard. I also understood that it was all about location. With a better spot, I'd make better money. I found one of those spots in downtown Chicago at a busy L station at Randolph and Jackson. I wanted my best friend, Big L, to go with me. At first, he didn't want to come to watch me back because it felt a little weird. Um, He was one of those who thought street performing was like being a bum, but because Big L was my best friend, he didn't want to turn me down, so he did it. I had, a motive, I had to motivate him by showing just how much money I could make. I played at Randolph and Jackson for as long as I could, but singing over the noise of the cars, the buses, the street sounds made me very hoarse very quick. I decided that underground in the subway would be a better place because there was an echo underground and the acoustics gave my voice a better sound, a reverb. The only problem was when I started to sing a lyric that I really wanted people to hear. If the train was coming into the station, it would make a lot of noise. I couldn't sing over the noise of an incoming train, so I decided to play it off and act like I was really jamming that part of the song. Then as soon as the train stopped and it got quieter, I would bring my voice up to give the illusion of continuing the song. No one could tell that I had stopped singing. The minute the train passed, I was right back in the song on cue without ever missing a beat. I learned to read the crowd quickly. For instance, sometimes there were a lot of white people down in the subway and I didn't want to sing something that couldn't relate to they couldn't relate to. So I started writing songs that felt like country or pop, trying to capture the spirit of their culture, and it worked. And sometimes there'd be a lot of black people riding the train. So I would sing songs. I knew they would relate to Ribbon in the Sky, Stevie Wonder, A Song for You, Donny Hathaway, and even some songs that I wrote myself. Money was coming in steady and strong, and I began to develop something of a following. But even back then, even when I was nobody, I had some haters. You ain't no better than a beggar, a neighborhood singer said. You're just a street beggar. That's all you are. I knew he was jealous because even though he wanted to, he couldn't really sing. He had a voice like a wounded frog. Besides, even as a teenager, music was like life to me, beyond restrictions or someone else's label. All singing's begging. What do you think Teddy P's doing when he sings Turn Off the Lights or Marvin Gaye? What's Marvin doing when he's singing Sexual Healing? They begging. Ain't no harm in begging, brother. Your begging don't get you much more than a cheeseburger. Didn't mom always say to turn lemons to lemonade? Well, I didn't know if McDonald's sold lemonade, but they sure sold Big Macs. People love their Big Macs. And the underground spot where I was singing was just below McDonald's. Right above the subway stop, I performed under ways I performed under was McDonald's. People of all colors would come down to watch the train, and a lot of them would have McDonald's bags in their hands. So I started singing about McDonald's, about how when your day is through, McDonald's is the place for you. I figured if I wrote a McDonald's song and sang it, 
as the people um, sang it, as the people with McDonald's food came down, not only would they pay me, but I knew they would give me a big kick out and I go home smiling. I made up lyrics about the icy Cokes and the apple pie, the chicken McNuggets and the tasty fries. And it worked every time I would bust out with a McDonald's song. The people would drop more and more money into my bucket. Things were looking up and up down in the subway before long. I had enough money for a new keyboard. I'm going to, I'm, I'd gone from a baseball cap to a paper bag, to a chitlin bucket within a month of street performing. People started hearing me and started catching the train from that spot just so they could see me perform. I started making so much money that people started to notice. When I say people, I mean the pickpocks down in the subway. I used to see them trying to pick people's pockets all the time and they never knew that I saw them because when I street perform, I would always wear black sunglasses like Stevie Wonder. It was a part of my act. So they didn't know I saw them till one day I had made so much money that my chitlin bucket was overflowing with tens and twenties and one dollar bills. Suddenly the thieves started turning their attention towards me slickly, but not wisely. I noticed it and told Big L that we had to watch these guys. He told me he was aware of it. I continued to sing. Then out of nowhere, one of the three guys that I knew was a pickpocket ran up so fast, snatched the bucket and kept going. My glasses immediately fell off my face. I think it was from the speed of me getting up to chase him. Me and Big L ran so fast after this guy that we got close enough for me to catch the back of his leg and swipe, kick his ass. He fell down and Big L started punching him. My money was flying everywhere and I was trying to collect it all. The guy had fallen down onto the tracks. I turned around to see Big L jump down onto the tracks after him. I remember yelling out, don't touch the third rail because I had heard that the third rail is the track that could electrocute you, killing you instantly. Big L got up on the platform and the pickpock ran straight down the tracks like Speedy Gonzalez out of sight. After that, I went to Kmart and bought a big rope. And for the rest of my street performing career, I tied one end of the rope to the chitlin bucket and the other end to my right ankle, figuring that if anybody was trying to take my money, they were going to have to take my ass right along with them. It never happened again. I had another memorable encounter when the street was my stage with the police. It was raining really hard that day. I had brought a chair and of course my keyboard and I was ready to go. Although it was raining, it was Friday and I felt sure the sun was going to shine on me because it was payday. That's when I made most of my money. Anyway, as I was singing and minding my own business, I had my black shades on and people were dropping bills in the bucket by the second. Business was booming until all of a sudden two cops walked up out of nowhere and said to me, all right, Stevie, let's go. My first thought was to act like I was blind. That's what they thought. So why not play along with it? But honestly, but honesty took over. I took the glasses off and said, what's the problem, officers? You need a license to perform on the streets. So I showed them my license. But for some reason, they took me out of the subway and straight to police quarters on 22nd Street. The police put me through all sorts of bullshit. The bottom line was I was in my rights. I had my license. They had to let me go. But they said that if I ever tried to set up in that spot again, they keep chasing me away. They released me, but they wouldn't give me a ride back to the station. So there I was in the rain with a keyboard and a chitlin bucket with money in it. I wasn't worried about the money getting wet, but I do remember being really mad because my keyboard was getting wet. I knew that it was soon short out and not work anymore. I was so pissed because of the injustice that I that I made my way to another spot three stations away from where the cops had chased me and started singing Superstar by the Temptations. A line in that song, remember how you got where you are, seemed to give me motivation. I sang it with so much soul, folks just had to stop and listen. It was then that I discovered the true power of my voice because that day, I made more money than I had ever made as a street performer. I sang it with so much soul, folks just had to stop and listen. Fall in love with the future. Don't look back. When I finally got up enough nerve to tell Miss McClendon that I couldn't read, write, or even spell, she told me about people who were brilliant, who had come before me, paving the way for people who were handicapped in some ways. She talked about Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder and how they were blind and overcame their disability and that the world loved them and their music in spite of that. 
She would even go further back and talk about how Beethoven was deaf, but he heard music and was one of the greatest composers ever. She even revealed a secret of hers that she had an operation on her hands and how it did not stop her from continuing to play the piano and composing music that is still sold today. Those inspiring examples gave me the hope that I needed. They were the light at the end of the tunnel that I had yearned for since the discovery of my disability. If they did it, Robert, she said, then I know you can do it. And for the first time in my life, I believed it. My mom taught me how to fall in love with the future. Don't fall in love with the present or the past, Robert, she said. Use it. Um, if you do, you'll stay in the present or you'll be stuck in the past. Um, if you learn to love the future, then you will get to the future. That's why I still keep my eye on the future every day. I believed everything my mother told me and I trusted Miss McClin's predictions about my future. Most of the time when she told me one day, Robert, you're going to be one of the greatest writers of all times. I listened. I wanted to believe, but with kids still laughing at me, it was really hard. Once I started street performing and making money, though, there was no going back. School got kept getting harder. School felt like something I could never conquer. School meant shame and humiliation. School just made me feel downright bad. I was no longer on the school's basketball team, so my on-the-court skills no longer mattered. Performing made me feel that I was worth something. The streets had become my stage and my audience was willing to pay me. I didn't want to face my teachers, the other students, or especially Miss McClin. I didn't want to let them, I didn't want to tell them I was a street performer because I knew they looked down on that. So I stopped going to class. In spite of Miss McClin's best efforts to keep me in school, I quit just like that. Instead, I started heading for the subway station where I could sound more like James Ingram than James Ingram more like Jeffrey Osborne than Jeff Jeffrey Osborne. I could sound like anyone. I could be anyone and feel like a million bucks. There were no tests to fail, no books to intimidate me, no judgmental looks from stuck up students who mocked me because I couldn't do what they did. My street following was getting so strong that I found that another street performer, say a sax player, got to my spot before me. I could offer to give him $150 to get him to move to another location. $150 was more than he made in two days. Meanwhile, I could make $150 in two hours. I hustled and printed business cards, then passed them around. The cards advertised that I could sing at weddings, at birthday parties, even at funerals. I was hired to entertain at all kinds of events, including stripping at women's bachelorette parties. Even back then, I felt that whenever I did, I had to do it creatively. So when I stripped, I had to tell a story or create a fantasy because I had learned enough about women by listening to women most of my life to know they needed to escape reality sometimes. So I come out as Darth Vader. I put on the black mask and the black robe. When I drop the robe, I'd be wearing nothing but my little patent leather drawers because I had a body. I was ripped real good. Women went crazy. Then I go from Darth Vader to Luther Vandross singing. You, don't you remember you told me, love me, baby? My voice gave me an advantage over all the other strippers working. Some might have had better bodies, but when I started singing, it was a rap. Some people thought I could dance as good as I could sing and stripping paid well. The money was rolling in, but so were the threats. I was naive about the strip party scene. It was controlling, controlled by big time thugs who weren't about to put up with some freelance kids dressed up as Darth Vader cutting into their profits. After about six months, the threats became so aggressive that I recognized I better stick to singing in the subway stations. Meanwhile, fi financially, I became my mother's biggest helper, a beautiful blessing. I love seeing smile the smile on her face when I gave her money. It made me happy to arrive home in th with three bags of White Castle burgers and the rent money. I was a bona fide breadwinner. Instead of an imaginary brick box filled with secrets, I got a real metal cash box where I kept my money. Soon I was paying the bills and saving hundreds of dollars and I was still a teenager. Then something happened that broke my heart. My metal box was stolen and everything I had worked for so hard, all my savings disappeared. I didn't know who did it, but obviously it was someone in our house. I didn't want to start accusing anybody. So the easiest thing for me to do was to just move out. When I moved into the YMCA downtown, close to some of the spots where I street performed, 
I had a single room with barely enough space for a bed. I sit up all night playing my keyboard and writing songs. Drug dealers, hookers, and pimps lived up and down the hallways and right across the hall from me. You had to share a bathroom and use a public phone. I didn't care. I was in survival mode. I kept a box of cereal, a carton of milk, and was good to go. Lenice hung in there with me. She was my girlfriend, and she believed in my dreams. While I sang in the streets, she worked as a cashier at the Amco gas station. We were in love, and things were coming together. What could go wrong? All right, so we're going to stop there. Um, and this is podcast seven. We're going to move into, um, podcast. Well, no, this is podcast eight. We're going to be moving into podcast nine tomorrow, act two and of the solar coaster, um, memoir of R. Kelly. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you tomorrow.